every house that Tracy and I have owned, we've always purchased some fixer uppers that needed a little bit of work um, so that maybe hopefully we could get a little bit better of a deal. About seven, eight years ago, I guess, I was driving down the road going to meet a guy and passed this house over to the right. And I noticed the grass was like really high, like up to my shoulders. So I get out there where I'm going and I ask the guy, hey, what's going on with that house down there on Main Drag out in the country? So he says, well, I think it's a foreclosure. So I'm headed back and, and I come to this house and I pull in there and sure enough, the grass was up to my shoulders. I drive up to the house and there's no front door. I mean, it, it's no front door, it's just an opening. And so I walk in and, and it was a newer home, but they evidently they had run out of money and took everything out, all of the, the light fixtures, bathroom fixtures. They took everything out of this house. Well, Tracy and I bought that house. And uh, over a process of several, what we thought was weeks and months and years, did a lot of work on that house. And it was neat to look at the before and the after pictures and to see the change. And really, that's what God does in the life of every believer. And that's called sanctification. Now, it's a big doctrinal term, but it's changing us from a person that is committed to sin and turning us into an image of Christ and a person that is committed to Christ. Now we've been journeying through the book of Thessalonians. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, Paul talks about faith. Five times in chapter 3 he mentions faith. When we come to chapter 4, the first part of chapter 4, Paul mentions three times our sanctification. Notice verse 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. Notice verse 4, that everyone should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification. Notice verse 7, for God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. And the word holiness, the Greek word behind it is the same exact Greek word that's translated sanctification in verse 3 and verse 4. You say, well, what does it mean to be sanctified or what is sanctification? Sanctification means to be set apart. And you and I are set apart unto God when we accept Him as our Savior. He begins doing a work in our life to change us so we're not the old people that we were before we're saved. We are being conformed to the image of Christ. So this morning I want to talk to you about a doctrinal term called sanctification and four steps towards sanctification. The title of the sermon this morning is Living for God in an Ungodly World. Now, so many times we get overwhelmed with life and we think, well, our world is getting so wicked and our world is getting so carnal and everyone's just living in such ungodly ways. But that's not the way it's supposed to be in the church. The world is supposed to be worldly. But there are problems when the church becomes worldly and when Christians become worldly. God's will is that we be sanctified. Is His will is that we be set apart. You say, how are we to do it? Four steps towards sanctification. The first step, the walk with God that testifies of sanctification. The walk with God that testifies of sanctification. Notice verse 1. Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how you ought to walk. So he's talking, he says, you know how you ought to walk because we told you. He's talking about how they are to live. You see, a Christian is to live differently than a non-Christian. A Christian is to act differently than a non-Christian. Now, it's nothing unusual for a non-Christian to lie, for a non-Christian to steal, for a non-Christian to cheat and to be dishonest and to be deceptive. It's normal for a non-Christian to live like the devil. But see, that's wrong for a Christian. 
See, the Christian is supposed to live like Christ. You remember Enoch? Enoch, God described his life, his claim to fame was not walking on water. His claim to fame was not healing anyone. His claim to fame was not doing great miracles. Enoch's claim to fame was his walk. He walked with God. Enoch pleased God. God summed up his life by saying, Enoch walked with me. Now I have a question for you. If God were to sum up your life today up until right now, how would he sum up your life? How would he characterize your life? Is there evidence that you've been changed, that you are a new believer? Notice on in verse 1, the goal of our walk, as ye have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God. The number one goal of every Christian should be to please God. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 29, For I do always those things that please Him, talking about God. Is that your goal? It was said of Enoch, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. Before his translation, he had this testimony, that he pleased God. Remember Jesus, after he was baptized, he came up out of the water, God spoke, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So is God pleased with how you're living your life? That is sanctification. Every situation you're placed into, every problem that comes into your life, how do you handle it? Is God pleased with how you're handling your relationships? Is God pleased with the type of employee that you are? Is God pleased with the type of employer that you are? Is God pleased with the type of spouse or the parent that you are, the goal of our walk. Look on in verse 1. So ye would abound more and more. There he's talking about the growth of our walk. You see, the Christian life is not like a telephone pole. It's more like a tree. Now, both are made out of wood, but the telephone pole just sits there and never changes. The tree is growing. It's producing fruit. And you and I as Christians are to be growing. We're to be abounding more and more like Christ every day. The walk with God that testifies of sanctification. Verse 2, I want you to notice. The Word of God that teaches us of sanctification. So how do we learn to be a Christian and to live this Christian life? The Bible. Notice verse 2. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. Commandments is plural. He's talking about precepts. He's talking about principles that we find in the Bible in how we're to, supposed to live. You see, the Christian is not to determine how he's going to handle his money by the way the world says to handle their money. The Christian is not to learn how to treat people the way the world treats people. The Christian is not supposed to, to learn how to be a husband and a father the way the world says to be a husband and a father. We get our instructions from the Bible. So the Word of God teaches us sanctification. Now notice in verse 2 it says, For ye know what commandments we gave you. And for the Christian... The Bible is our commandments. They're not just, oh, well, I don't like that one, so I'm not going to live like that. No, this tells us how we're to live. This tells us what is right, and the Bible tells us what is wrong. The Bible tells us what we're to do, and the Bible tells us what we're not to do. The Bible tells us how we are to live, and the Bible tells us how we're not to live. That is sanctification. We are, every believer is being sanctified, but we have responsibility in this. We have to submit. We can be stubborn, we can be rebellious, and we won't grow as we should. God says, hey, I'm working a process. I want to use you mightily, and it's your responsibility to submit to God's Word and you be sanctified. I know this is the last part of the verse. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. So if you say, well, I don't like what that preacher says, or I don't like what that church says, your problem's not with the preacher. 
And your problem is not with the church. The problem is with the Bible if the preacher and the church is preaching the Bible because your problem is with Jesus. He's the one that gave this to us. So the walk with God that testifies of sanctification, the Word of God that teaches us sanctification. Thirdly, I want you to notice the will of God that tells us of sanctification. Now, every young person especially wants to know God's will for their life. What is God's will for my life? Well, God has a specific plan and a specific will for every one of our lives. But He also has a general will. For instance, God's will for every person in this auditorium and joining us by way of rejoice is that you would be saved. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You see, all of us have sinned. We all have missed the mark of God's standard, which is perfection. Nothing shall enter heaven that will defile it. And since we do not measure up, we need someone to pay our sin penalty. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus came and died on the cross to pay for our sin, but you have a free will given to you by God. Although your sin debt has been paid, you have to accept Christ's payment. And God's will is that you would do that. God's will is that you would not perish, but that you would accept His Son. But it's your, your choice. God's general will for every one of our lives is that you would be saved. But here in verse 3, notice God's will for us is to be sanctified. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. Now understand that sanctification has a positive side and it also has a negative side. On the positive side, we are set apart unto Christ. We are set apart unto God, unto holiness. But we're also set apart from sin. We are set apart from ungodliness. Whenever God gives us a compliment and commends us for doing something, He also gives us a warning not to fall into something. And that's what Paul does here in verse 3. Look on to the verse. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain. That's a negative word. That you should stay away from. That you should avoid. That you should flee. And notice what he says you should flee. Fornication. It means any form of sexual immorality. Extramarital sex, premarital sex, homosexuality, or any form of pornography. If you are wondering, where in the Bible does God forbid sexual relationships outside the boundaries of marriage? Right here in this verse, God clearly forbids it. He tells us we are to abstain, to flee, to stay away from it. Now understand about the city of Thessalonica. It was a seaport city. There had many travelers coming through, and it was a wicked pagan city. They had the philosophy. It was just pleasure at any cost. Just live it up, and they were a very sexually promiscuous city. They had much wickedness and vileness that was practiced in their city. Sexual relationships were happening before marriage, in marriage. Homosexuality was rampant. Incest was rampant. Child molestation was rampant. They had a great problem with transvestites. In their day, there was this enormous pressure on all of society. Just enjoy life. Just live it up. And Paul confronts this thinking head on. Now understand... America is much like this city at Thessalonica. America and our sexual revolution has caused great harm and has brought much tragedy upon our country. The sexual revolution is and is trying to destroy the sanctity of marriage. The sexual revolution has brought a flood tide of sexually transmitted diseases. The sexual revolution has brought about this AIDS epidemic. The sexual revolution has infiltrated our country with vulgar language, 
with vulgar material, with vulgar websites, with, with vulgar movies and television shows. And they are trying to do everything that they can to destroy the, the Judeo-Christian heritage that is taught in Scripture. Now, for so long, we in churches have just gone into our little corner and said, we'll just do the right thing. But we need to come out of our corner. We need to hold up our Bibles and say, this is what's right. There's a reason that we have all of the sexual problems we have. There's a reason that sexual molestations are going through the roof. There's a reason that we have the sexual transmitted diseases that we have. And it's because we have forsaken God's ways and His ways are sexual purity. Now, Paul confronts head on two problems. Verse 4 and 5, he talks about premarital sex. Now, any sexual relationships outside of marriage is perversion. If it's before marriage or if it's extramarital relationships when you are married, it is wrong and it's wicked. And Paul confronts that in verse 6. Now, notice verse 4 that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Now, Bible students have been studying this verse for hundreds of years. And there's two great opinions on what this verse means. And it all comes down to the word vessel. What is Paul referring to when he says vessel? Now, the word vessel is used two different ways in the New Testament. Let me quote the verses to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So in 2 Corinthians, when he uses the word vessels, it's referring to my body, our personal bodies. But when Peter uses it in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, it's not referring to my body. It's referring to the body of our mate. Listen to the verse. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. So it's used two different ways in the New Testament. Is vessel referring to our personal body or is it referring to our mate's body? Now listen, good people have differing opinions on this. My personal opinion is it's referring to your mate's vessel. And here's the reason why I look back at 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 4. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel. The word possess is used seven times in the New Testament. Every time it's used, it means to acquire, to obtain, to get. Now, you already have your body, and I believe that it's talking about finding a mate, getting a mate, obtaining a mate, because that's what the word possess uses every time that it's mentioned. So understand, let every one of you know how to acquire, obtain, possess your vessel in sanctification and honor. When you go about the process of finding a mate, it should be done in sanctification and it should be done in honor. Now notice verse 5. Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. Lust of concupiscence is talking about lustful passion, out of control desires. Christians are not to choose a mate or to find a mate based upon lustful desires. We're to find a mate based upon sanctification, based upon honor, based upon respect. Now understand, there are over three million people in America living together outside the bounds of marriage. That is sin, that is perversion, and it's wrong. It's living based upon the lust of concupiscence, lustful passion. Our relationships, the process of finding a mate, should be building up the other person, not taking from the other person. So Paul talks about premarital sex. But look on in verse 6. He talks about extramarital sex. That no man go beyond 
and defraud his brother in any manner. So we're not to go beyond, we're not to step over the line and defraud or take advantage of. When you have sexual relationships outside of marriage, there are always victims. You victimize your mate. You victimize the other person's mate. You victimize your children. You victimize the other person's children. And God draws the line. And he says, hey, this is my standard. Don't step over the line. Don't go beyond the line and defraud others in this matter. Now, that's not what the world says. The world says, come on, you're teenagers. Come on, you're youth. Just go out and live it up. I'm here to say the world is wrong and God is right. The world says, no, 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 you don't have to be faithful to your wife. Go out and just have some fun. Everyone's doing it. I'm here to say the world is wrong and God's word is right. So let me just give you some practical guidelines. Number one, be careful with the music that you listen to. Parents, you should get involved in your children's music. Some of their music is horrible. And as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So I, pardon me, don't understand why you would listen to garbage talking about ungodly things and think it's not going to affect you. It does. And that's not building you up and helping you to be sanctified and choose a mate unto honor. That's tearing down your morals. I don't care what the genre is. If it's not based on Scripture and edifying in Scripture, we shouldn't listen to it. So be careful what music you listen to. You should be careful what you watch things that we would totally not agree with, we would allow to come into our living rooms through television, through movies, and it's just wrong. We say, well, I'm strong. Do you really think it's not having an effect on you? Hey, Dad, do you really think that it's not having an effect on your children? Be careful with the music. Be careful what you watch. You should be careful what you read. Now, it amazes me things that we would never listen to and the things that we would never watch will read in these novels. That is just gross wickedness. And we say, well, it's just a story. Well, it's just sin and it's just wrong and we should not be reading it or allowing our children to read it. One other guideline. We should be careful about the situations we go into. And parents, I say this with great delicacy, but you should be careful about putting your children in situations that's setting them up for failure. And I believe when you put two teenagers, opposite sex, in a car alone and just let them go off as they will, you are setting them up. You need to put boundaries and safeguards around them to protect your children because the devil's coming after your children trying to destroy your home. Hey, Dad, you should be careful about people at work. You don't need to go to lunch alone with your secretary. You should put boundaries there to protect yourself for the cause of Christ. You say, why? Look at verse 6. There are consequences to sexual immorality. Verse 6. Because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. Avenger refers to somebody who satisfies a wrong. Sexual immorality always brings God's judgment. It hurts you physically with sexually transmitted diseases. It hurts you emotionally with just the guilt. It hurts you spiritually by hurting your fellowship with God. Sexual immorality always brings judgment. Notice verse 7. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. You're living so unlike a Christian is to live when you fall into sexual immorality, when you fall into uncleanness. That is not God's plan for your life. That is not how God wants you to live. And look at verse 8. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God. 
who hath also given unto us His Holy Spirit. Now, when you rejected God's standards of sexual purity, you're not rejecting this preacher. You're not rejecting the church. You're rejecting God. You're saying, God, I know what you said. I know how I should set up some boundaries so I don't fall. But no, I'm not going to do it. You're rejecting God, and you're setting yourself up for failure. The walk with God that testifies of sanctification. The Word of God that teaches sanctification. The will of God that tells us of sanctification. Fourthly, I want you to notice the way of God that tutors sanctification. Now, God never gives us a command in Scripture without giving us the means to meet that command. And He does it again right here. Notice verse 8. He therefore that despises, despises not man but God, notice last part, who hath also given unto us His Holy Spirit. There it is. Or should I say, there He is. The moment you were saved, God gave you the Holy Spirit to live in your life. So you want to know the key to sanctification? Submission. In every area of your life, you have a financial situation. You come to the Holy Spirit and you say, Holy Spirit, I submit. What does your word say and how would you guide me in how I'm supposed to handle this matter? You have a relationship issue. College students, you're setting up guidelines for your relationships with the opposite sex. You come to Scripture, Father, Holy Spirit, what would you have me to do in setting up these guidelines? According to your word, you show me. That is sanctification, submitting your will to the Holy Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You say, you don't understand. I've already fallen. You don't understand. I've already made some tragic mistakes. 1 John 1, 9 is a verse for Neil Jackson, and it's a verse for you. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. And that is for you. We can't change the past. None of us can. But we can start all over right now and we can have a glorious ending. If we'll just submit and confess our sins, He will remake us and remold us into something beautiful. So I come before you today. All of us should make a commitment to sanctification. Every person in this auditorium should make a commitment to holiness. Every father should make a commitment to being the father that God would have you to be and leading your home in holiness. Every college student should make a commitment to sexual purity until you're married. Every one of us should make a commitment to sanctification. Maybe you're here and you've never accepted Christ as your personal Savior. Do it today. Accept Him as your personal Savior. Heard of children living in South America. They were poor, abandoned by their parents, living in absolute poverty. They had nowhere to live. And so many of these children would take up residence underneath the streets of the cities living literally in the sewers and under these streets of the cities of South America. They lived in filth. They lived in total darkness. And they learned to exist. They learned to be content in these dirty, nasty environments. Some good Christian people heard of them and began to come under the streets through this sewage-filled area and to minister to these children living as animals. They would bring them food, bring them their necessities with the whole goal of getting them out of this filth and putting them in a good home. But here's what they discovered the more and more they would gradually get these children out of this environment, they were reluctant to respond. 
because they would, they would see light. They were living in such darkness, they were not used to light. As they would be exposed to light, it would hurt their eyes. As they saw the light, they would see their dirt. They would see their filth. And it was a lot easier to live in a gross, dirty environment than come out to the light. And I'm talking to some Christians, and that's you today. You're comfortable in your sin. You're comfortable in your filth. I'm here to say, come on out. Come on out to Christ. He will show you the dirt that needs to be removed. He will clean you up and use you in a marvelous way. But it's up to you. You have to make the decision, will you come to Christ?